Commodus was an interesting guy. Let's talk about him. Let's get the facts straight first. Commodus was born on the 31st of August, 161 CE. His father was Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome, who had just become emperor a few months before. This made Commodus unique. He was the first emperor since Domitian, born over a century ago, to succeed his biological relative on the throne. Before Commodus, there had been five emperors chosen by adoption. Each time the reigning emperor chose an heir who was exceptional and qualified for the job. Commodus, by contrast, would get to rule Rome regardless of his qualifications. There is a conventional view of Commodus' reign, and then there is a revisionist perspective. I'm first going to talk about the normal history, which is what the ancient sources tell us. This is what most people think of when they hear the name Commodus. Commodus first came to power in 177, at the age of 16, sharing power with his father. When Marcus Aurelius finally died in 180, Commodus became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Commodus's first order of business was to end his father's war with the Marcomanni, which he had been fighting for over a decade. He mediated a quick peace with the tribes and raced back to Rome. He was called a coward for this, mostly because he celebrated a triumph in Rome to celebrate the great victory. Commodus was an unruly youth who loved parties, scandal, and excitement. He preferred to go to banquets and have late-night outings with friends rather than attend to the matters of administration. Thus, he delegated the actual ruling of the empire to his subordinates without providing them any oversight. This naturally led to corruption and violence. Much of Commodus' reign is the tale of backdoor court intrigue, conspiracies, and assassinations, all running without Commodus' active intervention. The first case came in 182, when Commodus' sister Lucilla attempted to orchestrate the overthrow of her brother. This attempt failed, and she was eventually executed along with a bunch of other conspirators. But this conspiracy awakened a deep paranoia in Commodus' mind, leading him to persecute any disloyalty harshly. The two most prominent figures in Commodus' early court were Perennis, the Praetorian prefect, and Cleander, Commodus' favorite palace chamberlain. Perennis was a competent official, but he was also incredibly ambitious and he began to plot against Commodus. Before he could orchestrate his takeover, however, his plot was exposed with the help of Cleander, who was also ambitious and wanted Perennis' job. After Perennis was executed in 185, Cleander became Commodus' closest official and the second most powerful man in the empire. Cleander succeeded in obtaining control of all public offices. He used his position to sell these offices to the highest bidders, a horrible example of corruption. He also deposed the Praetorian Prefect with Commodus' blessing in 188, consolidating pretty much all state power for his own purposes. In the year 190, there were a record 25 consuls, an absolutely insane number unmatched anywhere else in all of Roman history. Cleander became massively rich from the sales of these offices to ambitious men. Cleander's downfall came after a grain shortage in the city of Rome. The people rioted, causing Cleander to send the Praetorians to crush the mob. However, the people resisted by throwing stones and bricks, and the urban soldiers of Rome, who disliked the Praetorians, joined the people in pushing them back. Soon the angry mob was at the gates of the palace, where Commodus and Cleander were hidden inside. Commodus was persuaded by his other advisors that Cleander needed to die, and so he ordered him executed on the spot. His head was thrown out the window of the palace, and the people immediately calmed down. After the death of Cleander, Commodus took it upon himself to take a more direct role in ruling the empire. He had always portrayed himself as a godlike figure, taking the likeness of Hercules on his coins. And while Nero had performed on the stage, Commodus was a muscular young man who loved fighting in the Colosseum as a gladiator. He orchestrated spectacular displays of skill, including one spectacle where he killed hundreds of large animals with well-placed spear throws and arrows. He frequently fought opponents and killed animals, which provided the people with great entertainment. However, the senators saw this as disgracing the imperial office. Commodus instituted a propaganda campaign to remake Rome and the Roman Empire in a new image, one that revolved around himself. After a fire in Rome in 191, 
he began the process of renaming the city after himself, changing the official name to Colonia Lucia Ania Commodiana. He changed the names of the months to correspond to each one of his 12 names. The legions became Commodianiae, the Senate became Commodus' fortunate Senate, and the Roman people became the Commodianus. Statues of himself went up all across Rome and the empire at large. This megalomania was combined with persecutions of senators. Dozens, if not hundreds, were exiled or executed per year on suspicion of conspiracy. Finally, the senators and Commodus' close associates decided that he had to go. They attempted to poison him on New Year's Eve of 192, but he vomited the poison out, so they sent his wrestling partner to strangle him while he was in the bath. On a late New Year's Eve, Commodus died there in his bathtub. He was 31 years old and had been the sole ruler of Rome for 12 years. In the aftermath of his death, order was restored in the city. Everything was renamed, his statues came down, and references to his name and inscriptions were blotted out. The Senate issued a Damnatio Memori, a condemnation of Commodus' legacy. He was not to be remembered. Later historians, such as Herodian and Cassius Dio, wrote very negatively about Commodus, and it is from their accounts that we draw this story. But what about another perspective? Is there a different way to see this story than by portraying Commodus as the devil? First of all, numerous inconsistencies can be seen between Cassius Dio and Herodian, the two major sources on Commodus' reign. This immediately calls into question the legitimacy of their accounts. Additionally, Cassius Dio, who wrote the more comprehensive account, was a blue-blooded senator, and Commodus had plenty of disputes with the Senate. There's a pattern of senators writing negative history about emperors who oppose the Senate. And this may just be one of those examples. Examining the start of Commodus' reign, it is unlikely he was a very independent ruler. I mean, he was only 18 after all, and he had very little experience with any practical business. So by the end of the Marcomannic Wars of Marcus Aurelius, it was most likely a decision made by the elites and advisors surrounding Commodus to end the war, rather than a sign of his personal cowardice. Instead, it was a practical decision by the elites and it was an attempt to move on from past commitments. The truth is that Commodus remained immensely popular with the people and the army. His gladiatorial shows entertained hundreds of thousands over the years. Later emperors also revered him, calling upon his legacy and rehabilitating his reputation. Septimius Severus, a future emperor, actually had him officially deified. If he was really so bad, why would future emperors risk even mentioning his legacy, let alone celebrating it and making him a god? The crucial point in Commodus' reign was around the year 190, when he began to assert himself as an independent imperial figure. This was also around the same time that his disputes with the Senate began escalating and eventually became deadly. This was when he began ascending to megalomaniacal levels and making his associations with gods insane, even by Roman standards. But the fact remains that the people and the army accepted this insane escalation, even continuing to support Commodus through it all. Thus, it must have been a logical continuation of an already existing imperial cult, perhaps one that was supported by the Senate. So here comes an alternate thesis. Commodus' disengagement from politics in his early years was not his own choice. It was because he was only a figurehead and a conduit for powerful senatorial elites to once again exercise their power. He was thus made a harmless puppet for the first decade of his reign, unable to do anything himself. The senators also contributed to an imperial cult, helping elevate Commodus to a revered level to fit their own program of Roman renewal and prosperity. People need someone to worship, after all. In this construction, the problems came when Commodus came to want power for himself. He began asserting his independence around 190, resulting in an escalation of conflict with the Senate. His escalation of his propaganda to godlike levels was just an attempt to elevate his position relative to the Senate. Essentially, their own construction of Commodus backfired on them. Finally, the elites were forced to end it with an attempt at assassination, which, fortunately for them, succeeded. They were then saved to destroy his statues 
erased his inscriptions, and slandered him in the history books. The corruption of Commodus' reign was not his fault, but rather the Senate's fault. Cleander was selling political offices because he was an ally of the elites and wanted to benefit as many of his elite supporters as possible with political prestige. And he had plenty of reason to be paranoid after his falling out with the Senate. In this view, very little written by the senatorial historians can be trusted or taken at face value. The limits on the source material, particularly a lack of archaeology due to the Senate's campaign of destruction on his artifacts, are unavoidable. We can only construct ideas about what Commodus' reign was truly like. He may have been an irresponsible, paranoid, megalomaniacal youth, or he may have been suppressed by authority all his life and just wanted to be his own man. Commodus is a fascinating historical question, a look at how limited information can constrain our perspectives and force us to think outside the box. But whatever the truth may be, it is undeniable that Commodus' death brought on a new and dangerous era of Roman history. Rome would struggle on the road ahead.